Welcome to 805 Focus. I'm Dr. Cinder Sinclair with Nonprofit Connect, and we will be bringing you the latest on your favorite nonprofits, so get ready to be inspired. Our special guest today is Rachel Steidel, and Rachel is founder and executive director of YouthWell. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Great to be here. Oh gosh, what a great mission you have, and so timely. And so I'm just very eager to hear everything that's going on at YouthWell. So we are busy and expanding. We have um, been in Santa Barbara for seven years. We started out serving South County, and then when the pandemic hit, um, it actually was an opportunity, one of the silver linings, for us to expand our work up into Mid-North County. Um, one of the nice things about being able to Zoom, Zoom, even though I think a lot of us are tired of it, <laughs> is that yeah. it makes it a lot easier to bring people together. Yeah, I think you're right. So, so now, am I right you focus on uh, mental health issues with young people? We, everything that we are doing is focused on early intervention and prevention um, with mental health for youth through the age of 25 realizing that we have a lot of college students who also need to get support. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to support parents and their, and their kids in getting access to services and um, be able to get in before the crisis. So early intervention, I mean, before the crisis, how do you, how, how do you figure that out? How do you know <laughs> that, oh my gosh, there's something that's gonna happen? Well, so for years, there's been so much stigma about, around mental health and mental illness. Yeah. I think another silver lining from the pandemic is that all of everybody experienced that isolation. Yes. And I think it opened up a lot of people's eyes and there's a little more empathy and understanding of what that might look like for people. So even though um, we've had these issues for years, um, there's a lot more attention being paid to mental health and mental illness. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of barriers to access and there's a lot of waiting lists. Mm -hmm. And because right. of that, Often when people ask for help, if they are not bad enough, they move to the bottom of the list. And so that's where we get into this cycle of serving those that are in crisis, which we absolutely need to do, and it doesn't fix the problem, right? We don't want to see right. youth and families having to go down that road. We want to be able to get in early. And, um, and so a lot of what we're focused on is educating families on how to recognize the signs when someone might be struggling, oh, okay. um, normalizing the conversation around mental health, right? And then um, really encouraging people to ask for help when they need it. So to really take away the stigma that there's something wrong with asking for support. That is great. So I, I know I understand what you mean by early intervention. So tell me how that works. Do you go into the schools? How do you do that? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> we are doing all kinds of things. So seven years ago when I started YouthWell, we were really focused on bringing all of our organizations that do any mental health work, our um, school districts, our law enforcement, our hospitals, all together to have a conversation around oh, it. Wow. Because in order for us to improve things in our community around mental health, we need to be working in collaboration. Mm -hmm. There are just not enough resources and services to go around. So if we're not working together, if we're not understanding the issues together, then we're not going to meet the need. So when we started seven years ago, that was our focus and has continued to be the focus that we have a collaborative that meets, it used to be monthly, now it's quarterly. But from that, as we've learned and grown, we have been able to take on pieces that serve all of our partners. So for instance, we launched a resource directory uh, about three years ago, and it has all the mental health resources from um, prevention and wellness all the way through crisis. Mm -hmm. And it also includes both the nonprofit and the private sector, which is incredibly important because yeah. we have great nonprofits, but they can't serve everyone. We need to know about the private therapists and other treatment programs in yes. our community. And so that was one piece that we started was having a directory. We also do a lot of education. So we host workshops on a variety of topics. And when we do it, we're always doing it from a place of wellness, meaning we all have to manage our mental health every day, right? It's not something that's just for certain people. We need to practice self-care. Mm -hmm. We need to improve our relationships and friendships. And so when we do a workshop, we'll, do, um, we'll pick a topic 
that anyone can step into. And so we try to do, gear all of our workshops towards parents and youth so that they're learning together and opening up conversations. That's great. So where do you conduct these workshops? Well, they used to be in person, and Deckers was one of our great, has been one of our great supporters, and uh, we used to do it in their fabulous location out mm -hmm. in Glita. The pandemic changed that, of course. So we started doing them on Zoom, and actually we kept them on Zoom because, again, it allows us to serve the whole county. Okay. People don't have to worry about childcare. People can jump on at any time. They're typically always on a Sunday uh, late in the afternoon because that's a calmer time for families. And so, um, yes, they're accessible to anybody. And then the best part about that is they're all recorded. So we now have a library oh, of really great. helpful um, videos. And we have some teachers who've used them in their classrooms, again, to spur the conversation that they can put this on. Often we'll have a panel of speakers on it and they can put it on, get educated, and then have a, a conversation. That's great. Yeah. That's a great idea. And so do you use social media at yes, all? Yes, we, we do a lot with social media. So another big part of what we're doing is education. I mean, mm -hmm. with the education is outreach. So we did a big campaign last year um, that was focused around you are not alone. It's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And one of the fun things with that is that we um, I have a group of interns that I work with, and we are interviewing and reaching out to a lot of leaders in our community to put a face um, to put different faces with mental mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. So that again, it's not the idea that you have to look one way that it, they mean, we know that mental illness does not discriminate. So mm -hmm. it's not about socioeconomics, it's not about gender, it's not about um, uh, ethnicity. And so we wanted to put all these different faces with it and everybody shared why, why, how they practice their self-care. And so that was a fun campaign. And then every week we have uh, self-care tips that we put out and we also do a lot of educating on mental health disorders. So we'll do facts about what is depression? What does it look like? What are some of the symptoms mm -hmm. you might look for? And then what are the resources we have in our community? So our goal is to both educate on, um, to help with more understanding, but mm -hmm. it's also to always help people uh, learn about what resources are available and how to ask. Um, for the support. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So how do people find out about when this is on, how to And what we're doing? It? Yeah. So our website is youthwell.org and we keep it very up to date. That's sort of our central point of everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, so people can go in there to find out anything that we're doing. So workshops are throughout the year. The directory is accessible at any time. We have a community calendar that is for all of the things going on in Santa Barbara around mental health education. So support groups and workshops and trainings that anybody can access. Um, we're always thinking about what it looks like for a parent or a school counselor or a resource navigator to actually go through the process of trying to mm -hmm. find information. So anything that we can do to simplify that process is our goal. So we spend a lot of time just researching what's out in the community. We're on a lot of community meetings to just be present and listening to what the issues are and yeah. figuring out how we continue to solve them together. That's fabulous. So I'm curious, when you um, called all these professionals together uh, for this quarterly meeting that you have now, what was their first response? Were they like, oh boy, we were just waiting for somebody to call us together, or were they a little skeptical? Or um, That's a really good question. <laughs> I think uh, then and now that there were some that were really excited about it because uh -huh. they're feeling it, and there's nothing worse than um, having to tell people you can't help them, mm -hmm. right? But I also think there's plenty that are, that are get frustrated because I am very much about accountability. Ah. To me, it's about the youth and families. We need to be hearing what they need. We need to be hearing what the challenges are, and we need to be responding to that. And sometimes I grew up in this community. I love our community. I had a business here for 15 years, and even with all, and with all that, I would say um, I see a lot of a lot of times programs getting started without any input from families and so we're not always oh, meeting wow. the need. Yes. And so when we brought that first meeting together, and mind you I was not trying to start a nonprofit, <laughs> um, it came out of our own personal experience and I just wanted to convene everybody to have a conversation. And at that first meeting I remember saying to everybody, my hope today is that 
everybody share about their organization, but not the brochure version, the challenges they're having, mm -hmm. the things that aren't working, and how we get better at this together. Oh, and so the goal was to have and continues to be to have really transparent conversations because we don't help the system if we're only telling people all the good, right? I've served on a lot of boards and I would rather know the things that aren't working in that organization yeah. so we can support them in getting better. Um, we don't get better if we're not acknowledging uh, the challenges. That is powerful stuff. So, <laughs> Good for you. Not always popular, though. <laughs> well, that's okay. In fact, that might be a mark of, you know, success. Yeah. To me, if I'm going to do this work, I just I want us to be successful, and I meet with enough kids and families mm -hmm. that that is my constantly constant reminder of why we're doing what we're doing. So, at YouthWell, do you use volunteers? Yes, we love to use volunteers, and there's actually some new ways we want to use them in the future too. Uh, right now, we, we work with a lot of um, high school and college students and have internships that last anywhere from three months to a year and love working with students. I'm a big believer in bringing youth into the conversation. And I have three daughters myself between 20 and 24. And I know watching them grow up, um, I mean, you know this, that there is a big emphasis in high school for kids to get community service hours in order to graduate. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. The philosophy behind that is fantastic, but what has happened over the years with all the pressure kids are under is it becomes a checklist item. How do I get my hours over with? And it's just a matter of getting a lot of hours and that puts pressure on kids yeah. versus what we know to be true, which is volunteering can actually improve our mental health if we're doing something that is meaningful to us. And I learned that early on with my kids because my, I've always been interested in health and human services. My kids love animals. And so I remember when they were little thinking, oh, I'm gonna go have to help clean out bunny cages because this is what they love. And if I wanna get them inspired, I've gotta help them find their passions. Um, so I bring that up because for me, when we're bringing on interns, I look at it as an opportunity for us to mentor young people, to give them meaningful opportunities to get involved. And one of the projects we actually um, worked on as a group this last six months is to reach out to all of our nonprofits. And we have recently put together a directory of all of the volunteer opportunities oh. that are current and up to date with more than 40 organizations across all sectors. Wow. So that's on our website. So that again, youth, parents, families can get involved. I'd love to have everybody volunteer for us, but this isn't going to be everybody's interest. So yeah. there's things that have to do with cooking. There's things that have to do with animals and the arts. So again, trying to create positive ways for people to give back, yeah. improve their mental health at the same time, and get their community service hours. Wow, that so, is brilliant. So practical. Super practical, and hopefully um, it'll get utilized. We're working with some of the career centers right now on the high school campuses, which is great. And another piece, when you talk about volunteering, that we want to get going um, sometime in this next year is a compassion project, which is, for me, since the day we started this, I have had in my mind that we will know things have shifted and that we've eliminated the stigma when people start to bring lasagna to people's houses who are struggling with a mental health issue. Hmm. We do it when someone has a broken arm. Oh. We do it when someone has a baby. Mm -hmm. We do it when we hear of someone diagnosed with cancer. But when it comes to mental illness, mm -hmm. When people have a diagnosis or when people are struggling, mm -hmm. it's still very uncomfortable for people. And so they tend to back off rather than lean in. And so to me, if we can create a way um, to get more um, individuals in the community who are interested in helping just do those little things that can make a difference for somebody. So as an example, <coughs> one of the reasons I, um, and doing the work I'm doing now is that our own daughter started struggling in ninth grade. And um, as I told you before, I grew up in the community. I had been doing resourcing for 15 years. I have a clinical background. I knew what I needed to do to get her support. I knew how to ask. I knew what was available. We could not get her support. No, oh, golly. At all, for three years. 
one of the challenges and one of the reasons I focus on earlier intervention is that she was high functioning. She was playing a sport, she was in all honors classes. From the outside, everybody felt like she's fine. We have other kids that are yeah. much worse off. And so that hindered her. And I know a lot of other students that that's happened with where they are maintaining, but they are crumbling inside and they are yeah. not doing well. And so they have to reach that breaking point before anybody will help them. So going through that process, I realized how um, isolating it is, mm -hmm. how um, hard it is to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had known some of the things that I know now that I encourage people to do. I wish I felt comfortable enough then mm -hmm. to be able to say there's no shame as a parent. It's not about that you screwed your kids up. <laughs> I have three daughters. Um, my oldest girls are twins and everybody needs to be parented differently and we all have a different chemical ma makeup and and the other thing is our community i'm kind of sidetracking here but our community does a lot of really amazing work around aces which is uh -huh. all focused as you know on trauma and that is so important when we talk about teens though who are struggling with their mental health mm -hmm. we also know that you don't have to have trauma to have a mental health challenge and sometimes when we are talking about trauma, people start to think, and I remember my daughter said this at the time too, I don't feel like I have a right to feel the way I do. I oh, haven't gosh. had trauma in my life and I have a lot of support, so somehow I'm not deserving of this. And I've talked to a lot of kids since, and I've talked to kids who've said to me that they've been told that too. Your life is good. You have no reason to be anxious or sad. Yeah. That does not help no. us, right? And whether someone has a diagnosis or whether it's just a teen going through a challenging time, mm -hmm. we wanna teach them coping skills. We wanna teach them yeah. that it's okay to ask for help, that you don't have to be isolated. And so um, one of the things that we like to do is when we come together with teens is give them tools so that they feel comfortable helping themselves or helping someone yeah. that they see. And I feel so strongly about it, especially when kids go to college. Mm -hmm. uh, we have so many kids who hold everything together until they leave home yeah. and then things start to fall apart Gosh. and they don't know where to turn and it's so much harder for parents after their kids turn 18 to get them support yes, services. Yes, yes. Wow, Rachel, that, so, is, that is... So um, you're a 501, Youth yes. Well is a 501c3 nonprofit. So a person, I bet, could go on your website and make a financial donation. Which was always appreciated, Good. absolutely. Yes. And they could find out um, how to volunteer. Yes. They could find out how to find, um, uh, tune into your Zoom. Yep. They could uh, find out about collaborations that you have and just all the things yes. that you've talked about if they go on your website. They can, we are also in the process of starting some new parent, youth, and teacher support groups. Oh. So we're working with some of That's our partners. That's a good idea. So, I am such a believer in parent support groups because and support groups period because um, when you get together with other people who are going through the same experience, mm -hmm. you know that we have pep in Santa Barbara, right? Yeah. Like that was one of my favorite memories as a kid, as a new mom was going to my mom group, and I liken this idea to when you know when our kids were babies, it was okay to come together and it was uh -huh. encouraged to talk about what's going on, to support each other, to uh -huh. learn from each other. But somehow when you become a parent of a teen, there is no support. Everybody's right. focused on, are your kids getting perfect grades and there's bragging rights and what college are they <laughs> going to? And somehow we all pull back. Yeah. Support groups give parents and youth an opportunity yeah. to be able to connect with others without even having to explain themselves yeah. because they're with people who just get it and they can learn from each other, support each other. And we're doing one for teachers now because we have a lot of, um, since the pandemic, there's been a lot of issues with uh, parents and adults and students' lives feeling like they can hold boundaries because so much was let go during that time. Mm -hmm. And so we want to give um, teachers that support too on how do you connect better with the, the young people in your classroom um, mm -hmm. and truly make those connections. That is great. So. Oh, Rachel, thank you for your fabulous, powerful, wonderful work touching the lives of so many, and thanks for sharing your story with us today. Absolutely. Can I share one more thing with you? Or do you, are we out of time? We're probably out of time. We're out of time. Shoot. Let's, let's, let's have another chat. I would another love to. Time, though. It's been a treat to be here, and thank you so much for all the work yes. you do in our community. 
and thank you for joining us on 805 Focus, and we'll see you next time.